Welcome to Family Health Today, Arkansas's only weekly in-depth look at the medical and health issues that affect you and your family. Brought to you by Jones Television. In cooperation with our sponsors, Northwest Arkansas Heart and Vascular Center and the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Hello, welcome to Family Health Today. I'm Dr. Jeanette Neshwat. Times are tough and people are coming up with creative ways of cashing in and making some big bucks, including donating to sperm and egg banks. Carrie Davis reports. <laughs> At Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group, or PREG for short, Dr. John Payne says they've seen a 50% increase in the number of people applying online to donate eggs. Certainly we see every day how there have been more layoffs and, and money's tight and, you know, with prices increasing, uh, people are looking for a way to, to uh, make ends meet or, or increase their income and, and it certainly on the surface can look like a, a quick, easy uh, payday. The same is true for sperm donation. Dr. Payne says the increase in applicants is good news because there are more couples than ever before looking for help. There's becoming more and more need for donor eggs as women uh, put off childbearing due to uh, furthering educations, careers, later marriages, remarriages. He says in the upstate you can make $4,000 if your egg is picked and sperm donors can make about $100 per collection. However, Dr. Payne says it's not that easy to be a donor. We, we find that the majority of women that begin the process don't meet the initial questions. You have to be between 21 and 32 years old, a non-smoker, and meet a whole host of other physical and mental requirements set by the FDA. It could be several months uh, until you could be compensated, or it could be a year or more. So it's not, not a quick buck uh, that can be earned from it. But for the ones that do choose to make money through egg donation, he says it's a good thing because you're giving couples more of a choice when they're struggling to become a family. Dr. Payne says if you choose to donate an egg, you only get paid once, you pass all the health criteria, and a family selects your egg to use. For sperm donation, it can take six months before you will receive any payment because it has to be tested for genetic disease. Well, it's no secret that our bodies change as we age. Some changes you can see, such as wrinkles and gray hair but others you can't, like those that take place in our bone and muscle structure. Dr. Sanjay Gupta takes a look at how to keep our bones and muscles healthy as we age. Overhead, take it up. It's five in the morning and Margie Oreck is already exercising. Down. An avid rower who's now in her 50s, Margie says her passion for exercise has made a difference as she's gotten older. And I can lift uh, easily things that I couldn't lift and my body feels better. It gives me a lot of energy afterwards. When it comes to exercise and aging, there is a catch-22. Exercise is crucial to keeping your bones and muscles healthy. However, too much impact can hurt you. So as you get older, it's a matter of finding that happy medium. According to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, as we age, our bones change. Around the age of 30, bones begin to lose minerals, like calcium, making them more fragile. As we get into our 40s, we begin to lose actual bone tissue. But exercise can help regenerate bone tissue and minerals, slowing the onset of osteoporosis and arthritis. It's important in those that have arthritis uh, and those who are trying to prevent arthritis to cross-train, to get involved in a number of other sports. So that if your knees are starting to hurt or you sprain your ankle, then you can cross-train. Also, our muscles begin to shrink and the number of muscle fibers decreases make sure to keep them limber. So it's important even more so in the 30s and 40s and 50s and beyond to do stretching before you exercise and stretching after you exercise to prevent injuries. Orthopedists say it's never too late to start exercising. Studies have shown that people even 50 or older who have never been active can improve their bones and muscles by taking on moderate exercise like walking, light weight lifting, even rowing. Just ask Margie. For 30, 40, 50, I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Pricey gym memberships and fancy equipment aren't essential to staying in shape. If it's a fit body you're after, don't worry. Money matters don't have to derail your plan. You just need a few basics to get started. Using your own body weight is a great way to tone your body. 
And if you have just a little bit of money to spare, invest in some exercise tools. Try to integrate some cardio drills like running in place, but make sure to stretch and talk to your doctor before starting any workout. A golfer who suffered an apparent heart attack on a Southwest Florida course is expected to be okay. Luckily for him, not far away was a father and son trained in CPR. Also nearby, a course ranger and club pro trained on a defibrillator. Judd Cribbs reports. He, he was saying, get help, get help. So I picked up the radio and called a pro shop right away. One of our rangers, Tom, was out there and he got on the radio and said, we got an emergency, called 911 right away. We were waiting uh, to hit onto the green and I looked over and I told my dad that I thought they were performing CPR on someone. We drove up there real quickly and noticed that the fellow was really in bad shape. Me and my dad kind of took over and I was doing the chest compressions and he was doing the breathing. Fortunately, we were successful with what we were trying to do until we got help. We get out to number five and uh, the two gentlemen are doing the CPR. And at that time, you could tell he looked like he was in pretty dire straits. Um, so, you know, it was obvious that we were going to have to use the defibrillator. Sometimes you get him to like start breathing a little bit again, but then he'd just stop again and you have no vital signs. First time you know, open up the package and you're kind of, you know, you had the training and stuff like that, but you're still, you know, handshaking the whole deal. So we grabbed the scissors, cut his shirt open to get his chest exposed. Luckily, it's a great, great machine because it's got right on the strap where to put it on this side of his chest, on that side of his chest. And then it speaks to you and it says, please move away from the patient, analyzing. And then it said, shock needed. And then they continued the CPR. By the third time, when it analyzed for the third time, it said, shock not needed. And by the time the EMT arrived, she started talking to him and he was talking back. Some disabled soldiers from Georgia recently had a unique opportunity to swim with some of the biggest fish in the world. Judy Fortin has more in today's Health Minute. Retired Army Specialist Scott Winkler has rolled his wheelchair down many ramps since he was paralyzed five years ago while serving in Iraq. But he says nothing compares with the chance to swim with thousands of fish, including whale sharks, at the world's largest aquarium in Atlanta. Mentally, you're actually taking a stress break from, from life itself. Physically, it's great rehabilitation and stuff like that. Retired Army Private First Class Orlando Perez likened the experience to floating on air. He suffered a spinal cord injury during basic training 13 years ago. Never thought that being disabled was going to bring me to do something so amazing. It's, I think, how overcoming the disability, not letting the disability overcome you. Therapeutic recreation specialist Susan Oglesby says for paraplegics, being in the water is liberating. The water is a great equalizer. Once you get into the water, you're floating, you're weightless, and everybody becomes equal. Equally excited, too. It's beautiful down there. Peaceful, and you just forget that you're in a wheelchair or anything. It's almost like you're in able body again. It makes you feel so free. At least for a little while. For today's Health Minute, I'm Judy Fortin. Up next on Family Health Today, we'll be talking about the importance of vitamin D and why researchers believe it could help in the fight against Alzheimer's disease. Stay with us here on Family Health Today on Jones Television Channel 22. Getting fit, eating right, and staying up on the latest health news. They're good habits that can help you look and feel your best. You can get the details on the top health and medical stories every week in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the state's largest newspaper. Take a more hands-on approach to good health and pick up some good habits, like the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Welcome back. Vitamin D has become a subject of intense study as scientists find more and more diseases that high levels of vitamin D seem to protect against. Easily obtained by the exposure to the sun and also available in some foods, insufficient amounts of the nutrient have been linked to major diseases such as cancer and cardiovascular disease as well as a host of other conditions. In a recent study from UCLA and UC Riverside, researchers found that vitamin D combined with curcumin, a chemical found in the spice turmeric, may help protect against the plaques that cause Alzheimer's disease. To learn more about the role of vitamin D, we are joined by Dr. Michael Moulton, a nephrologist. Welcome to the show, Dr. Moulton. Oh, thanks for having me. What is vitamin D and why is it so important? 
Well, vitamin D is a general classification of a group of, of fat-soluble vitamins, uh, various forms of vitamin D. And, um, and the reason it's so important is it's uh, and becoming more important, as you just spoke to, uh, it, uh, certainly important for uh, metabolism of uh, calcium, absorption of calcium. But what we're finding out is that uh, vitamin D insufficiency and vitamin D deficiency seem to put people at risk for various health conditions such as osteoporosis, fractures, and now uh, seemingly of lots of other illnesses such as multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, colon cancer, and, and those sorts of things. So it's become a hot, a hot topic of research uh, even just in the last two, one to two years. Why do you think that is? Why the sudden craze of vitamin D throughout the United States? Well, I think one of the things that uh, they've done a lot of studies uh, sort of uh, not classic studies where they're double-blinded and set up to prove a point, but there have been associations between insufficient levels of vitamin D and deficient levels of vitamin D and, and, and rates of various illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis. And, and multiple sclerosis was probably the, the first study where they showed, uh, and there's always been sort of a latitudinal association with multiple sclerosis that few people really had a good understanding of. Much more common in northern latitudes, much less common in tropical areas. Somebody finally sort of said, hey, maybe it's vitamin D. They did some studies to show association between vitamin D levels and multiple sclerosis, and bingo, it looked like there was an association. Mm -hmm. They've extracted that to look at various inflammatory conditions like arthritis and uh, cardiovascular disease, colon cancer, uh, not to mention the, the classic things that had already been proven like osteoporosis and things like that. I so, see. How much vitamin D does a person need each day and does it vary from person to person and a, from a, age a, groups? No, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, obviously in, a, in newborn and pediatric literature it's been studied pretty significantly, and in, in, in breastfed infants, uh, there, you need mm -hmm. vitamin D supplementation. Infant formulas in the U.S. are all vitamin D supplemented. And then as through childhood, much less, in adulthood less, and then as we become older as senior citizens, then you'll need more vitamin D. The, the top sort of tolerable limit has been set at about 200 inter I'm sorry 2000 international units per day the recommended has been about 200 international units a day uh, but that actually was based on levels that we now would consider insufficient so not and so the levels that we're looking at for people for to demonstrate vitamin D sufficiency are quite a bit higher now so um, we're probably going to look at maybe raising the tolerable amount of vitamin D on a daily basis. Is so. it possible to have too much vitamin D or does it, the body just excrete it when there's no, an overload? No, unfortunately vitamin D toxicity is something mm -hmm. I see on an intermittent basis, uh, especially with things like mail order chelation type therapies and, and some, and there are people that get involved with hypervitaminosis or megadose vitamins. And so once you get over of uh, 8,000 to 10,000 international units a day on a prolonged basis, uh, you start to see things like kidney stones, elevated calcium levels. Um, and in the 1950s and 1960s, when they really were fortifying milk aggressively, there were even some cases of pediatric uh, neurologic injury from, from toxic vitamin D levels. I see. Besides milk, what are some other ways of obtaining vitamin D in our bodies? Well, um, unfortunately, it's very difficult to get vitamin mm -hmm. D, which is why the we've probably been seeing an insufficient a population full of insufficient insufficient mm -hmm. vitamin D patients. But mainly salmon, sardines, any fish that sort of has a high fat content. Um, the orange juice is now fortified with vitamin D, milk's fortified with vitamin D. Uh, so really it's all dietary per, per se. And of course then sun exposure would be the other way to get yeah, yeah. vitamin D. Tell us about more about sun exposure. The sunlight hits our skin, a chemical reaction occurs, and right. then what? Well, it's, it's, it, there's sort of, to, to try to make it in not too biochemical, mm -hmm. a cholesterol-like substance that's in th that circulates near the skin is uh, the ultraviolet rays from the sun change that into something uh, which is sort of a pro-vitamin D 
uh, form and, and it's isomerized into something called vitamin D2. Now, um, that takes about what they call casual sun exposure. Once again, they've looked at this in kids mm -hmm. a lot more than in adults, but most people think arm and face exposure about two to four hours a week in a normal adult is is enough to to produce enough vitamin D to remain sufficient. But yet at the same time, we're advised by our friendly dermatologists and, and doctors to you know protect ourselves when we go out in the sun to wear at least a minimum uh, SPF of 15 to prevent melanomas and skin cancers and basal cell carcinomas. So I guess we just have to find a balance. Is that, that right? That's absolutely correct. Difficult balance and especially, you know, people with more dark pigmentation patterns require mm -hmm. more time in the sun for to produce the same amount of vitamin D as people who are lightly complected. Um, as we age, we sort of stay out of the sun more, especially in the geriatric population who may not get out into the sun at all. Different cultural, different cultures and different ways of dress sort of limit sun exposure. So everybody really, it, it kind of is a very uh, a difficult uh, thing to say specifically, but, but uh, most people who are uh, get outdoors to some degree with uncovered arms and, and face, uh, maybe two to four hours a week will have, that's plenty of sun exposure. So, Dr. Moulton, low vitamin D levels, they can actually contribute to colon cancers and various types of diseases like you mentioned earlier, osteoarthritis and lupus. Are you surprised by these findings and are there any other diseases that can result from low vitamin D levels? I, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised, yeah. I must say, because I've kind of been doing this for 25 years. So, you know, I've gone mm -hmm. through the, uh, going through vitamin C was the sort of the, the new beat all, mm -hmm. end all. But, but th these studies look very, these are very good uh, studies that have been peer reviewed. They're mostly associative studies where they try to eliminate uh, you know other potential risk factors, but it looks like like some other fat soluble vitamins and, and may be uh, uh, anti-inflammatory. Um, so there may be a role for for vitamin D being an anti-inflammatory as regards eye disease, uh, you know arthritis and, and colon cancer. And since most disease processes are thought to be at least have some inflammatory component, that may mm -hmm. explain those issues. So you you mentioned earlier eye disease, what, does it increase the risk of glaucoma, cataracts? There's, there's, there's some theory, there's some thought that, mm -hmm. that um, because the typical fat-soluble vitamins and lutein and that sort of thing have all been shown to sort of reduce uh, cataract development, that other fat-soluble vitamins, including vitamin D, may also nice. be uh, be helpful. Now, uh, not being an ophthalmologist, that's not right, I'm not right on mm -hmm. the cutting edge of that, but uh, I have ophthalmologists who write me letters every day asking me to please supplement their patients with vitamin D because they are very firmly uh, in belief that that's very help, helpful to good eye health. I know the body sometimes has to balance out. If you have too much of one vitamin or mineral, it'll get rid of another. Do you see that in your practice, in your clinic? If someone has, uh, for example, high potassium, they'll have low, uh, you know, phosphorus levels and uh, also yeah. having you know altered vitamin D levels because something else is lower high yeah the one thing I mean I, I do see a lot of uh, you know as the phosphorus levels increase in chronic uh -huh. kidney disease that that turns on parathyroid hormone which revs up you know vitamin D production and so uh, that's sort of a closed circle in chronic kidney disease and there you're trying to fool the parathyroid hormone into quieting down so you use things that look like vitamin D M more importantly I think maybe for for people who are or vitamin D deficient is sort of getting to the root cause of that and if it's a gastrointestinal problem, in other words, if they can't absorb mm -hmm. vitamin D, and that happens with people who've had gastric bypasses, have Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, uh, you know, celiac sprue. So what happens is if you don't absorb vitamin D, which is just a typical fat-soluble vitamin, then you have to start looking at other fat-soluble vitamins. Are they vitamin A deficient, vitamin D deficient, vitamin E, vitamin K, the four fat-soluble vitamins? So, I mean, when I see people who are vitamin D deficient, I try to kind of go down that gastrointestinal pathway a little bit and, and just to sort out, is there something else we should be thinking about? Well, a good, well-balanced diet along with a little bit of sunshine and you should be okay. You should be okay, right. a little fortified milk and maybe some orange juice. And uh, in older age groups and younger age groups, vitamin D supplementation is definitely warranted. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Molden, for being here with us. We appreciate oh, it. Thanks for having me.
Coming up on Family Health Today, ever wondered why it's so hard to resist those not-so-healthy food cravings? We'll get some answers next on Family Health Today. Award-winning Jones Television, Northwest Arkansas's 24-hour nonprofit cable cast is now on the internet. JonesTV.org features a first-hand look at what the station is doing for the organizations and people of your community. The site gives you access to the daily TV schedule, as well as various clips of shows hosted by local experts. And our community calendar gives local organizations the opportunity to promote upcoming events in Northwest Arkansas. Jones Television, Channel 22, bringing you timely community programming, public service announcements that benefit our nonprofit partners, and now an easier way to learn more about us. www.jonestv.org. Some dreams are universal. Dreams that inspire us. Multiple sclerosis is a devastating disease that changes lives forever. The National MS Society does more for people with MS than any organization in the world. This is why we're here. Because nobody dreams of having multiple sclerosis. Call 1-800-FIGHT-MS. The Shriners Hospitals for Children provide world-class orthopedic, burn, and spinal cord medical care to children at absolutely no charge. And they combine that with the state-of-the-art research and teaching programs. Call this number for more information. Shriners, having fun and helping kids. The state parks of Arkansas, the natural state, are all about the timeless beauty of Arkansas. Special times with family and friends. Old times and new times. Leisure time, quality time. Arkansas's state parks are here for you. Call for the free guidebook with all the details. Sponsored by this station, the Arkansas Broadcasters Association, and your Arkansas state parks. Aren't you glad we've got them? Welcome back. If you're heading out in the sun for a little fun, don't forget to lotion up. You don't want to get a painful sunburn. We get more on this medical condition from the pharmacy. Signs and symptoms of sunburn usually appear within a few hours of exposure, bringing pain, redness, swelling, and occasional blistering. Because exposure often affects a large area of your skin, sunburn can cause headache, fever, and fatigue. Sunburn treatment doesn't heal your skin or prevent damage to your skin, but it can reduce the pain, swelling, and discomfort. You may find self-care measures helpful. These include taking a non-prescription anti-inflammatory medication, applying a cool compress, and applying an aloe vera lotion. Sunburn typically resolves on its own within a few days or weeks, depending on the severity of the burn. Use these methods to prevent sunburn. Avoid the sun between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Cover up, use sunscreen frequently and liberally, and wear sunglasses and a hat when outdoors. From the pharmacy, I'm Carl Collier. The transition from drinking only breast milk or formula to eating grown-up food is a big milestone in the life of a baby. So how do you know when to start introducing solid food? Well, pediatrician Robert Wiskind says four to six months of age is the ideal time to start introducing solid foods. He suggests serving rice cereal first because it is easy for an infant to digest. After that, you move on to the fruits and the vegetables. The stage one or the first stage foods are single ingredients pureed. And you're doing one food at a time because you want to be sure you can identify anything that the child is allergic to. Wiskin says eggs, fish, citrus, and nuts are some of the foods that are most likely to cause an allergic reaction, such as a rash or vomiting. He recommends waiting to serve those foods until a child is at least a year old. One final warning, honey should not be given to a baby under the age of one because of possible botulism. Well, organic foods have their advantages, but some consumers say they're too expensive. But there are ways to include organics on a low-cost budget. Nearly every supermarket chain now has an organic line of food or within their store brand, they carry organics. Also, join a price club. 
um, Costco, BJ's, Sam's Club all have organic foods. Also buying in bulk is another great idea. You can buy nearly every kind of grain in bulk and um, organic whole grain brown rice is only about 99 cents a pound. Well that's a real savings if you're on a low cost budget. Well all of us crave certain foods like ice cream, chips and pizza. But why do we crave them? It turns out there's scientific evidence that shows our brains are being hijacked by food. Alina Cho reports. Ever wonder why that chocolate chip cookie seems to have so much power over you? Or why potato chips are so addictive? Just one. <laughs> Bet you can't eat just one. Researchers say our brains are being hijacked by fat, sugar, and salt. Add flavor, add texture, add temperature, add color. And what do we end up with? One of the great public health epidemics of our time. Former FDA commissioner Dr. David Kessler is author of the new book, The End of Overeating. Kessler says by combining fat, sugar, and salt in all kinds of different ways, food makers are stimulating our desire to eat, even when we're full. Back 20 years ago, the average bite had about 20 chews. Today, food goes down in one or two chews. It's a whoosh. We get stimulated and we reach for more and more. We just can't help ourselves. Just ask four-star chef Danielle Boulou. You know, the spicy, the sweet, the salty, the crunchy. The chef Boulou treated us to a tasting menu, a bite-sized symphony of sweet, salty, and fatty foods. It's about fat. Um, <laughs> it's about tasty fat. With every taste. Oh, it's so good. This is. I found myself. Oh, my God. Then, unable to stop eating. Mm. You don't know why, but it feels good. <laughs> like the short ribs that melt in your mouth and mashed potatoes with cheese inside. Sometimes you don't even have to taste the food to know that you want it. Sometimes it's the eyes. You know, you, you, you cross a room with a beautiful souffle or something, and everybody's looking and say, oh, I want that. <laughs> Why Boulou agrees with Kessler that portion control is so important when it works. We don't control how much you eat of it. We just control how much we give you. <laughs> now, if you want more, that's out of my control. Moderation and exercise just as equally important. Well, thanks for being with us for Arkansas's only weekly medical report. If you have any health news or story ideas that you'd like to see on our program, we'd like to hear from you. Visit our website, jonestv.org, and drop us a line. Join us next time here on Jones Television, Channel 22. I'm Dr. Jeanette Neshwat.